Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this year's Taubman Forum on Public Policy. Uh, my name is Elaine Kmark. I'm a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and I'm going to be the moderator for this session on COVID-19 and the federal government. Um, this forum is the 12th one in a series, and it was generous, generously endowed by Alfred A. Taubman. He was a wonderful friend of Brookings, as are his children, Bobby, Bill, and Gail. We appreciate all that they have done to help us inform people about public policy issues. I'd like to remind our viewers that we can, you can submit questions for panelists by emailing events at brookings.edu or via Twitter using hashtag at Taubman Forum or by tweeting at Brookings Gov. Now, I thought I would introduce the rest of my panel here. I'll start, I don't know how you can see me, but I'll start to at, at the top here with Lee Drutman. Uh, Lee is a PhD in political science from my alma mater, Berkeley, uh, you, you see UCAL Berkeley. Um, he's a senior fellow at New America in the political reform program. He, he is a um, history, his big book lately was called Breaking the Two-Party Doom Hoop, The Case for Multi-Party Democracies in America, which sounds like a really intriguing book and I hope he'll talk a little bit about it. Um, the, bus the other book he wrote was The Business of America is Lobbying and he is the winner of the very prestigious Robert A. Dahl Award uh, in 2016. He also is a co-host on the podcast, Politics in Question. So Lee, thank you for joining us today at the Brookings uh, Taubman Forum. Pleasure to, pleasure to be with you. We then go to Tom Wheeler. Tom Wheeler is a visiting fellow at Brookings. He was chairman of the Federal Communications Commission from 2013 to 2017. Um, and there he had quite a record. He led the process that eventually adopted net neutrality. He was a champion for uh, pr privacy concerns and for increasing cybersecurity. Um, he's an entrepreneur as well as an intellectual and his latest book is called From Gutenberg to Google, which I think is one of the great all time titles. <laughs> and last but, Thank not, you, least, Thank last you, but not least is Nicole Turner Lee. Dr. Lee is a fellow at the Center for Technology Innovation here at Brookings. Um, she comes from the multimedia, multicultural media, telecom, and information council, a nonprofit that dealt with the intersection of race and technology. She's written extensively about race and broadband access. And in fact, her groundbreaking 2009 study has been the impetus for a great deal of major uh, legislation and action in the United States Congress. So we have three people here, I think, well equipped to lead off today's discussion about uh, the United States government and um, the crisis that we're in. And I'm gonna start by asking everyone, perhaps in the order that I introduced you, so Lee first, um, what have we learned so far about US government capacity functioning, whatever, in COVID-19? Well, I think we've learned two things. First is that the government is really important. And I think it's something that a, a lot of people maybe had taken for granted or tried to deny. And the, the central, the, the federal government in Washington plays an incredibly important coordinating role that when it's not doing it, it becomes quite apparent. I think the other thing that we're maybe not learning, but maybe just reaffirming is that the lack of trust in government and the uh, excessive partisan polarization is really making it difficult for us to effectively respond to, to this really dangerous and frightening crisis. Tom, why don't you- So I, so I, think, Lee, I, I think Lee just hit the, hit the nail on, on the head. I mean, the, the reality is we have a government that is populated by very good people who are living in institutions that were created in another time. And that if we know anything about COVID, 
it's that it um, it was it spread everywhere at once and challenged everybody at once at a at an exact same time when our government was structured to deal with things. Well, it's always been this way, serially down the line. And so we've been challenged in how to respond. And I think, in a, you know, I want to echo what my colleagues have said, Elaine, as well. But I want to add something different as I sit next to a historian and two political scientists. What we've actually learned during COVID-19 is that inequality is quite entrenched in our society and that the government has done very little to sort of address that. I mean, the inequalities that we have seen manifested in education uh, disparities and digital access disparities when it comes to employment disparities of who's been on the front line and who has not. What we've actually seen is that this government, you know, and, and I don't wanna put it on one administration just has been un, you know, incapable of addressing some of the historical inequalities that have led to uh, an unequal distribution of access to power and to wealth. And what is surprising is that a pandemic, a pandemic would actually reveal such glaring inequalities in ways that I think um, going forward, we got a big problem to address. Okay, why don't we, why don't we go to the next question? I, mean, I think all of these are important aspects of this, of this problem. I mean, we simply, are hobbled by the current levels of polarization, and we are hobbled by the longstanding um, disparities in wealth in this country, not to mention race, which coincides with that, but also seems to have a separate and, and more and different impact on it as well. But so why don't we start with you, Nicole, and I wanna ask the second question, which is, what would you do? You were you were king tomorrow, queen tomorrow. What would you do? You know, I've entertained that question several times. Um, <laughs> if I were able to actually change the scenario, I think what I would do is one, we have to recognize that we're coming out of an administration where the polarization that we've all discussed is real, right? And I think the extent to which racial polarization and the racial profiling of COVID-19 in particular is going to lead to much more fracturing that we had even before we started this pandemic. I mean, we were already in this, it's just actually worse. I would say going forward, the other thing that we're gonna have to deal with, and I'll give some examples of what I think we really should do, is that we're learning where there are vulnerabilities in systems. You know, 53 million school kids stayed home as a result of the pandemic, and districts across the country because of equity challenges struggled to get people online. That should have happened, right? Uh, and we're seeing the magnification of health disparities, particularly in the number of people of color, as well as people who are low income or in uh, abject poverty, who were not able to get access to sufficient health care. If, if I had that pen, Elaine, you know what I would do? Mm -hmm. I would start with a commission, a commission to really understand what happened, what are the lessons learned. And I wouldn't actually do what we've previously done in administrations and have some big commission with advisors that we think can answer any and all questions, I would actually take the root of the problems that actually manifested. We need a commission on whether or not we can actually move schools towards remote and distance learning in a way that is appropriate and timely and ex, you know, expeditious. We need a commission on digital divide. Are we paying attention to digital access in this country? Uh, my colleagues have all written books. I got a forthcoming book coming out on the US digital divide next spring that will actually address this. We also need to look at healthcare. Uh, Tom and I both know about the use and practice of telehealth. Let's come out of this with lessons learned that have been based on this three week national pilot of telehealth services and see if we can continue that. So I would think, you know, we really have to stop putting band-aids and looking just at symptoms. And let's do what we did with uh, the COVID-19 virus and let's stop the spread of inequality. And the only way that you do that is you actually have to sit down and address it one by one, Elaine, or else we're gonna be back in the same situation once we have another blind spot that takes us by storm. Great, thank you. Hey, Tom, do you wanna tackle this? I mean, you're, you're king, uh, what would you do, <laughs> okay? <laughs> They, Don't blow up his head. <laughs> so, so let me try it from a, a, a slightly different point. I think the points that Nicole raises are excellent, but uh, you know, as a as a recovering regulator um, and a uh, and a, a network guy, I spent my life in in, in technology. 
I, I think that what we've learned um, from COVID is the importance of digital technology. I mean, stay at home. Um, if we didn't have uh, Zoom, if we didn't have Netflix, we'd all be slashing our wrists. And, and, and we have learned that the, that the, the, the network and services that deliver the internet to us maybe used to be nice to have, but now they're critical. And yet we have this critical capability that has absolutely no public oversight. You know, Eric, Eric Schmidt wrote a book a few years ago in, in which he said that the, the internet is the world's largest ungoverned space. Mm -hmm. And here we have this incredibly critical capability that is totally ungoverned and the and government is not equipped to to deal with it because we have our government has always been organized around industrial concepts you know i ran an agency that um its statute was written in 1934 when radio <laughs> was just developing and it was last amended in 1996 when the internet was screeching modems and AOL, mm -hmm. and and we need a set of statutes and structures that will relate to the reality that we have as a result of living in the information era rather than in the industrial era, and those solutions aren't bolt-ons to some uh, existing structure built for another purpose, but they are new builds to say, this is the new digital reality. What do we think are the standards that ought to govern that? So I think the challenge to how do you reform American government is to say, okay, how do we get out of an industrial mindset and into a digital age mindset? Well, I, two, two little comments before we go to Lee. One is you said, what would we be doing without the internet? I'll tell you what we'd be doing. We'd be going outside. We'd, we'd, be go, yeah. we'd be out, we'd be, I mean, I think the staying in place, which is working a little bit, but probably not as well as people, I think nobody would have been doing that if we were not able to conduct as much business as we have been conducting on Zoom. So, so we'd, be in, we'd be even in a worse pickle. When, when you say, I mean, it's intriguing, the internet being the world's largest ungoverned space, governing would have to be international, would it not? Well, uh, so here's where we, this is where we really fall out of bed as a result of our governments long-term, this doesn't fall in any specific administration, but long-term, saying we won't get involved. Yeah. Um, the, the, because what's happened is that the United States used to be the leader in how the world thought about network and technology policy. Mm -hmm. I mean, two weeks after we adopted the net neutrality rules of the FCC, I was in London sitting down with the 28 counterparts of the EU, helping them write their net neutrality rules so they would follow ours. Mm -hmm. But in a world in which we have pulled back and said, no, we don't want any kind of regulation, we have left a void. And we have left a void to the rest of the world to come up with their own rules that because, to your point, Elaine, because we're all interconnected, we have to end up dealing with and we've also left a void, which I know is something that Nicole worries about, where when the federal government doesn't get involved, hey, the states get involved. And then we have 50 different policies. So there is a real consequence of us not trying to step up and do something to establish basic rules about how this critical service is going to operate. Okay. Lynn, can I jump in on that real quick before we just switch modes? Yeah. Um, and before we go to Lee, so I think Tom is absolutely right that I think what we've actually seen in this ecosystem is that the critical nature of the internet is beyond, you know, a question now. We know that we need to actually build infrastructure. We know that these applications that we're actually using now need the level of uh, infrastructure, bandwidth, support, you know, capacity, 
flexibility and innovation to do all these things. But I do think we need to be careful. This is where Tom and I do uh, know each other on this realm about how much government oversight is necessary. If I look at the handling of this pandemic in particular, the government oversight of it was absolutely horrible. And where we have seen government come in and take over in terms of management, we've not always seen great results. I think to complement what Tom says, I think we should reverse the question to the, the, the statement to, we need government to actually work in partnership with those players where we actually find these types of gaps exist. And I've been really intrigued by, for example, in some of the areas where kids do not have access to technology, where we're actually seeing these types of partnerships step up, uh, particularly when districts have no solution to do this by themselves. So I think to me, that's really, and I, and I appreciate what Tom is saying, I, I've sort of thought about what this looks like going forward. And clearly, for example, in places like rural, it may be a partnership or it may be areas where we have to support some government, um, not necessarily incentives for people, for private sector to build out, but different models to actually look at how we actually de develop solutions. So Elaine, we're 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 filibustering and keeping Lee yes, sorry, off, of the, say, off of the air. Yeah, Lee, but, yes. but, but, but let's but let's, let's come after Lee let's finishes. Come let's, come <laughs> you know let's come back to that. Let's come back to this. Yeah. On this. Well, I want to come back to that. Lee, go. You, floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Well, if 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 I were a king for a day, I'd, I'd immediately give up the throne because America shouldn't be ruled ruled by a king. And, <laughs> and, and for sure, I don't have all the answers. Uh, I mean, and I, you know, I fundamentally believe in the in the pluralist democratic process for solving our problems. But I think, as both Tom and Nicole have have eloquently pointed out, we have a, a mounting number of problems that have gone unsolved for a long time. I think, as you know, Nicole has pointed out, and you know, we, we see the incredible inequalities that have been hiding in plain sight for a long time in this country and you know are just it, it's impossible to to ignore the ways in which this uh, pandemic is having disparate impacts on on people depending on their ability to work remotely depending on their ability to um, you know uh, live in, in get away to to places where they they you know can can safely social distance uh, you know, it's just, it, it, I think we're going to just, we're, we're seeing these, these incredibly uh, disparate impacts that's, that are just not okay. And I think we all know that they're not okay. And we've just been letting this go on uh, for too long. And, and to Tom's point uh, you know, about the, the economy and the industrial age uh, of the past trans, uh, transforming into a new era and us just not having any sort of regulatory infrastructure in place to deal with that. I think that's exactly right. I think one of the things, uh, I mean, we've basically had since the since the mid 90s, we've had this kind of paralysis in Washington where we, we've just been unable to solve problems as political polarization has gotten worse and worse and everything has become campaigning and gamesmanship and fighting this game of inches to get this elusive unified control that you know, then, then never happens. <laughs> then never happens, and you know that's been the abiding uh, drive of our politics. And the process has, you know, not worked for almost everybody in this country. And it's turning people off from politics. The number of people who say they think government in Washington is broken is, you know, basically that's the one thing that everybody agrees on. A uh, number of people who now call themselves independents is higher. It's a distrust of, of both of the parties. And, you know, we're, we're having these same, you know, partisan blame throwing contests, you know, even now when we should be trying to, to solve this problem. And you know, it, uh, the societies that have, have managed to keep this, this virus and this pandemic at bay are high trust societies where people under expect that everybody else is going to pitch in and we're all going to share the same information. We can trust what the government does. Uh, I just read a poll this morning. Democrats think that there are, there's a higher number of deaths than has been reported. Republicans think that there's a lower number of deaths that's been yeah. reported. I mean, on, on every issue here, we, we don't trust one another and we think that that somehow the other side is is out to get us. Uh, and this is this this hyper partisanship, which is preventing government from addressing problems that I think there, there are a lot of issues. 70, 80 percent people know that there's a problem, know that there's a better way. 
and it's just all political gamesmanship. And this is where, where I get to, to, you know, if I were king, which believe me, you don't want me to be king. Uh, but, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a way in which we have this electoral system, which creates these incredibly perverse incentives uh, of just trying to get this narrow, elusive majoritarian control uh, and it just doesn't work with our political system. It's driving us apart into this, this binary us versus them that just doesn't work with our brains. And so what, what I would do is I would get rid of this antiquated first past the post system that drives us into these, that has driven us into these two uh, binary camps and open up our political system a little bit more to make it less us versus them. I've been a big supporter of ranked choice voting as a way to kind of open up some space and some fluidity. You know, I'd like to move to a, a, a multi-party version of that, which is, you know, I'm borrowing from Ireland and, and Australia, uh, New Zealand, I think are all countries that, that have had successful, you know, moderate multi-party democracies. I, I think that this binary is just creating this incredible gridlock that is stymieing innovation, stymieing problem solving, exacerbating inequality, exacerbating urban rural divides, exacerbating racial divides, and we're stuck in it until we get out of it, we're gonna be stuck. So, I mean, I, I really hope that this moment can expand our imagination. I mean, certainly I, I think it's expanded our, our imagination to uh, think beyond uh, this sense that we have that everything is kind of just, you know, we'll, we'll kind of muddle through uh, because, I, you know, now, now we're deep in the mud and there's no more muddling. We're, we're, we're stuck in it. <laughs> well, I, you know, that, that brings me, that brings me, I don't want to go to questions from the audience just yet, but it does bring me to something I wanted to bring up and Michael in our audience also brought up. And let me let me let the three of you think about this for a moment. How do you see federalism evolving through the pandemic and afterwards? That's Michael's question. And, and my question would be how one of the things that's happened in the last six weeks really is that we have moved our attention from the president and Washington to the governors. And the governors, you know, I think everybody had a little civics lesson about the 10th Amendment to the Constitution when the president asserted that he had he was in control and the governor said, no, 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 we're we're actually in control of a lot. Um, and so we, we, we're kind of having a, a federalist moment here, too. And is there anything that we should be thinking about in terms of the future, in terms of the relationship between the federal government and the states. Why don't I start with Lee and go around Tom and Nicole? Yeah, well, this is this is a great question, and you know, I mean, certainly, you know, the the question of of where should uh, authority come from, and th this goes back throughout our history, and there have been constant <coughs> struggles over, you know, whether the cities states, the federal government has authority and, and lots of battles. Uh, and, you know, generally the trend for the last, you know, really 60, 70 years has been towards more authority in Washington and less authority yeah, uh, right. at, at the state level. So we, we've been moving towards a more, more nationalized system. Now, you know, th this moment of, uh, basically, uh, you know, dereliction of duty in Washington, I don't, I don't know what else to, to call it, you know, has created an opening for a lot of states to, to take different approaches. Now, one of the challenges about federalism in this particular moment is that it's not like the, the virus stops at the, the state border. Uh, and so, you know, what happens in one state depends on what happens in the neighboring states and lots of people travel between state lines for for yeah. work and so I, I think it's a particularly big challenge for federalism. Certainly I, I think there are areas in which states and cities are, are better equipped to solve problems but you know, I think we're in an era in which it's very hard for states individually to solve what are national and increasingly global problems. So if you think about the regulation of the internet, if you think about climate, if you think about, uh, you know, inequality, uh, you know, I, I, these are these are fundamental challenges that, I, you know, I, I certainly support different states doing experiments. But, you know, I, I think 
there are the the flow of people is you know very much between states and you know and so i think you know i don't i don't you know i, I don't i don't see federalism as a as a solution to a lot of this it's it, sometimes it's been a been a release valve but e even to the extent that w what we see as federalism now is not the Brandeisian and laboratories of democracy federalism it's red states versus blue states yeah um tom um yeah take on uh, the federalism question and then then i i will i will remember before we go to other questions to come back to this governance of the internet okay well let's be real real quick the the, yeah. the the laboratories of democracy i was that was gonna be my opening line lee you got it i you nailed it uh, <laughs> all right well and, you can go first next time <laughs> and 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 the but um this also relates to Elaine's previous question, which was about this interconnected world that we live in. And, you know, one of the stories I tell in From Gutenberg to Google um, is about uh, how railroads used to have to go to the state line and stop, mm -hmm. and particularly yeah. in the South. And, um, and the, um, in the middle of the Civil War, um, Robert E. Lee, of all people, <laughs> petitioned the Confederate Congress to allow the railroads to interconnect because he was being bested on the battlefield by the interconnection of railroads in the North and their ability to move troops from one theater to another. And the Confederate Congress told him no. <laughs> oh, wow. And, and you can go back, you can, you can look at, 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 at major Chickamauga and other major battles and see that was probably a reason why those battles were lost. That we live in an interconnected world. We need to have a common set of rules for that interconnected society, at least inside our own economy and our own society. Yeah, and Elaine, I, I just will bring up, I think uh, my colleagues have sort of brought up the reason why we have to be very careful about going back to this or keeping, maintaining this relationship between the, the federal government and state governments that appears to be quite contentious, particularly in the handling of COVID-19, because I think people at the uh, state level just felt as in other issues when it came to immigration. And I mean, this is not new, right? that states have felt that Washington has been too slow to respond and has not necessarily been in the best position to do that. But what worries me, and I think Lee can actually echo uh, my sentiment here, is what do we do about those types of regulations or statutes, as Tom has also suggested, that require federal leadership? You know, I'm worried if we say, okay, post COVID-19, let's give more authorities back to the states. What about the Voting Rights Act? And what's happened when it comes to the degradation of, um, you know, the exercise of the right to vote when states are in control. Look at what's happening with reopening right now and states that are rushing to open up because in many respects, they don't feel like they have a majority population that's going to be infected because that's not what the media is telling them, right? Or that's not what the federal government has painted in terms of who's, who's mostly um, affected by, by the virus. So that worries me. I mean, I think again, COVID-19 has sort of surfaced these lessons that require further conversation they require further healing and they require, you know, a, a, a long range discussion of how we bring back in, to the point of this conversation, a balance in American government, right? So we're not being ruled in some way, even though none of us up here want to assume the role of king or queen. I know one person who's pretty happy with that title and who are <laughs> nameless, right? But at the end of the day, that's not what we want to do post COVID-19. We have done a great job in the U.S. improvising through this. But that okay. improvisation should not become the norm. Okay, so let me let me remind our viewers here that if you want to um, send in questions, you can email uh, events at brookings.edu. You can Twitter using hashtag Taubman Forum or by tweeting at brookings.gov. Okay, so let me remind that. But I want to go back to an earlier question first, which is, the, the question of governing the internet. I think, I, I agree with Tom, I think that's gonna loom large as we come out of this. And 
how does how do you see that happening? I mean, great, yes, granted, we yeah. um, we do not have the American leadership right now, but let's assume let's assume that this era ends one way or the other, um, and that we come back to a more normal um, American government, which does seek to to uh, be leader in the world. What does this look like? What would they do? do? Are you thinking, do you have the European Union model in your mind? Um, no. What are you thinking about? No, so I think we've got to start, Elaine, I think we've got to start with the recognition that the, the digital environment, both society and the economy are very different from the industrial um, uh, environment. And that um, government has been built on an industrial model, you know. So, so when the agencies of the federal government were created in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, they stole the management model of the companies they were supposed to regulate. And, and what was that? Well, you had a guy on the shop floor, and he was a guy, right, who followed rules, who was supervised by a supervisor who followed rules who was supervised by a manager to make sure everybody else was following rules. And we're surprised that we have a rules-based bureaucracy. Right. That's not the way the digital world works. Things moved so, move so quickly. And, and we have in, introduced what's called agile management rather than this rules-based bureaucracy into the management of companies, but that has not reached out to the management of government. And so what would that look like, for instance? Okay. One, I think you would take the agencies of government that deal with stable industries in relatively stable technology and leave them alone. But you'd say, we've got a whole new segment of the economy that is built on rapid change based on digital technology and how do we establish standards for that? And here, Nicole will be stunned to hear me say that I agree uh -huh. with her that that is not the kind of traditional industrial era micromanagement that we have seen before, oh. which is also to your point, Elaine, do you copy the EU? No, we need to say, okay, you know, the, the national electrical code covers how our houses, why our houses don't burn down. It's established by industry and enforced by government. FINRA mm -hmm. oversees the operation of financial markets, similar kind of way. How do we create a structure, a digital agency, whose job it is to bring these forces together, both the, the companies and the public, to come up with standards that can then be used as the guideposts for how you uh, run the economy and that are enforceable. And that is an entirely different concept from anything that government has done heretofore. Okay. And gotcha. Elaine, I'll just jump in really quickly because um, just if I can, because uh, Tom and I have been on this uh, pathway for a very long time. I think I agree with him in terms of not looking at the traditional standards of how we've governed the internet. And I want to push it just a little further when he talks about agency, because in my book, I'm suggesting that, you know, really at this time, we need to have a chief digital innovation um, entity that actually deals with, I think, the embracing of new technologies. The thing about government um, intervention that worries me, to Tom's point, that we actually don't always look at standards, we look at ceilings. And ceilings on innovation is not going to, I think, cultivate right. the type of environment that we did see that was somewhat agile under a COVID-19 situation where we can remove the regulatory boundaries of, uh, and barriers on telehealth and have people be able to Skype and FaceTime their doctors in real time. So it's just, I think it's, this is probably a, a, a topic of another conversation, but I do agree with Tom. I think international governance models will not plug and play into the United States simply because they have different values around the role of technology generally. But I think we as a country have seen other areas, and Elaine, I'll just leave with this. When we talk about internet governance, my hope is that we don't walk away and say who controls the inter but rather, internet, but rather we look at things like federal privacy. We look at things like the digital divide. I was so happy after 25 years of doing this, 
to hear a plan on digital access come before Congress just a couple of days ago and to treat it not on the margins of our society. We just need to re, uh, you know, formulate how we're looking at the internet and technology in general. And I think come to some kind of balance between what Tom is mentioning and where we are today. All right, this obviously, this, this alone, could be another entire Brookings forum. Because yes, me and him, me and him. With the two of you, yeah. Because um, I know I'm fascinated by it. I think Lee, you probably joined yeah. me in that. But but let's go to some of our audience questions because I think we've got uh, um, we've got some really good ones. Um, why don't we start with you, Lee? And this is a question from Carlos. And he says, without the will to do institutional reform, is there any way to diminish polarization? Um, well, <laughs> I mean, my, my belief is that we actually need institutional reform because we need to shift the underlying incentives. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I think there are some ways to diminish polarization without institutional reform, I think, are trying to, to build up factions within the existing parties that um, are, are not quite aligned with their, their core party. And I mean, perhaps, or perhaps the other way, I mean, in some ways, the, the way to diminish polarization is, is to change what we're arguing about and to add, an, add a new dimension of, of conflict. Uh, and, you know, what, one area that I think gives me a little bit of, of, of potential hope is the way in which there are some voices in the Republican Party uh, and, and I'm thinking about Josh Hawley here and Mitt Romney to some extent that, that are kind of rethinking the role of government a little bit. Uh, and you know, I think creating some potential for some new cross-cutting issues. I mean, this, this is my nerdy political science perspective is that the, the way to, to, to uh, we've got a party alignment that's basically stuck in this zero sum fight, but it's also an urban rural fight and it's also a culture war fight and it's also a race and identity fight. So it's all these these things that are layering on top of each other. And you have these political coalitions, which I, there are wedge issues that would split Republicans and Democrats internally uh, and potentially create some new alignments that wouldn't make everything seem so zero sum. So if we were having different political fights and maybe if we were having more political fights in the sense that we're actually, there's a lot of issues that we're just not <laughs> debating, uh, frankly, because the, the uh, leaders in both parties basically only want to let the issues that they think they can win on come to the surface. So there are a lot of fissures potentially within both the Republican and the Democratic Party. And if Mitch McConnell were just to let senators have the floor and bring up a bunch of issues, you, you might see a, a lot of interesting cross-partisan uh, coalitions come up. And if Nancy Pelosi were to see the floor and let a lot of rank and file members bring forward bills, you might see a lot of interesting uh, cross-partisan coalitions forming. But the problem is that rank and file in both parties have ceded so much to the leadership because yeah, they're so concerned about maintaining power and they don't want to open up that process because it might make their side look bad on some issues. And that's kind of, this is kind of a chicken or egg problem. Uh, you know, I think the, you know, to me, the, the institutional solution is more likely, uh, but, you know, I could see a revolt, a bottom down revolt in both parties saying, look, you know, I actually came to Washington to solve problems. I think there are a lot of Democrats who are frankly frustrated that Nancy Pelosi is running the show because they feel like she's not addressing a lot of issues mm -hmm. that they care about. And there are a lot of Republicans who are frustrated that Mitch McConnell is running the show because he's keeping them from debating a lot of issues. So I think that would be a sort of revolt of the bottom, but it would be, it would be chaotic. And it, you know, it, for uh, uh, until a new equilibrium emerges. But you know, I mean, our, our the world is chaotic, so maybe our politics should be a little you know, bit more chaotic. When I was in graduate school at Berkeley, as opposed to when you were at graduate school at Berkeley, we used to talk about the shifting coalitions in Congress. We would read whole books on yeah. the shifting coalitions in Congress. There really was a day when, you know, liberal Republicans might 
move with the Democrats on a certain issue. And of course, that in those days, you had a lot of Southern conservative yeah. uh, Democratic congressmen who often voted with the Republicans. I mean, but the, the concept, this, this voting that they have now, where everybody votes absolutely lockstep, uh, that's, that is something pretty new. Yeah. Let me turn but, to but, but Elaine, doesn't that start with the people being limited in their ability as to who they can choose by gerrymandering and other kinds of things that, yeah. that, that, that you go to Lee's point about, about let's get a broader choice of the people we send rather than somebody who's targeted, okay, I got this very specific district, this is what I'm going to take care of. I, I mean, I think that's right, but I think Lee, you probably agree with me, the political scientists can show you that gerrymandering, while important, is really not the whole story. Yeah. I mean, we, we have self-sorted yes. in the United yes. States yes. in a yes. rather yes. dramatic way in the last several decades, in a way that we didn't years ago. And this, this goes to Nicole's point as too. The self-sorting has also put us into, you know, uh, areas of great prosperity and all the left behind areas. So this is this is something that I think, I mean, I think gerrymandering reform reform could do a little bit here, yeah. but I don't think it it's the whole story. Yeah, that that's that's exactly my reading of the political science evidence yeah. too. That there are a lot of a lot of trends that have caused this. You know, and some, you know, and gerrymandering, you know, on the margins, yes, but I think the the, the definitely the broader story is the urban rural polarization of of our parties and the loss of liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats. Yeah. I mean, we had something much more like a four party system with those shifting coalitions. And, right. and now, you know, I mean, in, in many ways, I would argue that although we've sort of in, in name had a two party system for you know, most of American history, we've really only had a true two party system for the last decade or so in which the, the parties have no overlap. And that's and that's the new thing that's happened. And that's uh, that's created this this just intense game of inches dysfunction that, that is really preventing the government from dealing with any issue, whether it's innovation or inequality or you know, anything that we care about. Let Let's take a question now from uh, from um, Brady, and I think we'll let you start with this, Nicole. Um, how do we reform government to make sure marginalized communities aren't left out this time? Yeah, that is a hard thing, Brady, because we'd actually have to go back in the history books and redo how we actually started our society because it's based on inequality. You know, I would suggest uh, one of the things I've written about at Brookings that I think could be very timely. And again, going into a new election cycle, it could be an opportunity for whoever is elected, which is to recharter the Kerner Commission. You know, clearly what Lee is talking about in terms of racial polarization is real. The health inequalities that we've seen, the educational disparities, uh, the employment disparities are all part of what was discussed during the Carter Commission report, which suggested that our society had basically developed these fractures that led to some people, you know, being at the top, as Elaine put it, some people being at the bottom. And now what's even worse is that we got more people at the bottom than we do at the top. And those people at the bottom, it's particularly evidence in this disease, are those that are most exposed to more inequality. You know, I tell people when we come out of this, imagine all the folks that have been told to not pay. You know, we're assuming that the jobs that were lost are actually going to be recreated. And we know, uh, for the most part, who's going to be most affected in terms of rehire. So I would suggest that the federal government take a long, hard look at this. Let's not keep putting up policies that say, okay, we're going to create, you know, more opportunities and, and wealth assets. We're going to create more programs for education opportunities. Let's have a serious conversation in the United States. Go back to what we tried to do with the Carter Commission, which I think to this day may not have had the uh, impact because it was somewhat myop myopic at the time based on the tension that we had then. But I think we have enough smart people to start coming up with what I believe will be an inclusive plan for recovery. You know, where is that discussion happening now as we come right. out of this? And so I would just suggest that's the response to that. We can't solve all the problems that have been affecting people like me, but we can at least have a conversation to make sure they don't affect future generations. So here's, here's one that takes us in a slightly different direction, but I think pretty central to the time we're in. And it's from Solveig. And she writes, how do you believe that the pandemic will affect our healthcare policies going forward? 
You want to lead off, Tom? Well, you know, that's a, it's a fabulous question that I have a little personal experience with. I just got, um, first of all, I had my annual physical online two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I had bled and, uh, you know, obviously you can't do that online. Right. Um, and, but, but I had my annual physical. Um, and then I got um, a note from my doctor saying that um, they were having the, the, the COVID had shut the office down, had changed all the economics, and she needed now to start assessing every uh, patient $300, $315 as an annual fee that you would pay to be able to have services, uh, not a concierge doctor like some wealthy people have, yeah. but this was what it took to keep the place open because the economics have changed because nobody's coming through the door, therefore they can't do any billing. So I, I think that there are an awful lot of, well, we've always done it this way, that will end up getting revisited. The insurance, the insurance companies won't pay for telemedicine? They will pay for certain parts of telemedicine, but not all of the telemedicine. And, and Elaine, tomorrow we have an event, just a shameless plug on telehealth <laughs> for the people who are watching, who have been particularly interested in healthcare. Uh, we have a paper coming out on the telehealth possibilities post COVID, as well as uh, people from the American Medical Association and Doctors on Demand to help us talk through this. Good. So Solveig, I hope that you can tune into that one too. Lee, any any comments on health poli on um, healthcare policies? Well, it, it does seem to me that th there are tremendous externalities of a healthcare system that doesn't cover anyone and requires people to have employer-based health insurance at a time when a lot of people are losing their jobs. And you know, and to the extent that you know. It, if you have an environment in which people are suddenly without health insurance at a time in which they need to be able to get care and coverage if if they are sick and they might go without it because they you know which can have you know tremendous externalities to other people in spreading that disease and you know i mean i think you know the the case for employer based healthcare system uh, an employer based healthcare system has always been weak I think the fact that 30 million people have lost their jobs in the last few weeks makes that yeah. even weaker. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. I also think that um, maybe not with this president, but certainly with a subsequent president, we're going to see a public option um, added added in based on you know the model of Medicare and that the public and that we may evolve to a point where healthcare is more similar to Great Britain, where people have the fundamentals, but then they buy extra uh, policies if they want to, above and beyond, or, or, or like it is for Medicare with a Medicare patients who can afford it by wraparound uh, policies. So we, we, we may be, I think this is, this is probably going to be a big push in, in that direction. I've got to, uh, I want to ask uh, a one more question that's sort of narrow, and then, then uh, Thomas has sent in a, a really big think question. But, um, you know, um, what should we change? This comes from Serge. Do you expect or should we want to change the role of the federal government after the pandemic? I mean, we discussed earlier how we have, we've kind of fallen into this mixed system. Federalism seems to have come back a little bit because the national government in Washington, the, the president, seems to have failed in a, lead, in a key leadership role. Um, and so the governors have, have gone into the breach. But uh, moving beyond Trump, because I think it's, it's hard to do because he's so, you know, he's such a powerful force in, in our imaginations, not to mention our lives. Um, moving beyond Trump, how would you want to see a different role for the federal government? Why don't we go Tom, Nicole, and Lee? Tom? Well, well, you know, I mean, the federal government has evolved over time, okay? I mean, um, you know, early on, um, it was, you know, basic uh, national defense, um, some uh, taxation for imports uh, and, and things like this, and then the Industrial Revolution came along. 
and, uh, and it made us totally rethink the role of the federal government. And now the digital revolution comes along. And again, I think we have to rethink. And, um, and the lesson of history, I believe, is that ultimately we do, but it takes a while. <laughs> and, um, and that one of the dangerous things is to think that day after tomorrow, everything changes. Um, okay. When you look at the, and, and, and we should not set up that false expectation because we, we will fail um, on that. But we need to start down the path saying, just because we've always done it this way, is it only an excuse for not thinking? And, um, and, and how do we change uh, the way in which we approach things and constantly be improving? I mean, again, I go back to the fact yeah. that the last time we considered telecommunications policy in this country was 1996. So it's time to do it again. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Where's yours, Nicole? You know, I would say, and um, that's a really hard question. How should the federal government change? I think the federal government has pretty much been static, but to your point, I think people have changed, right? In the handling a variety of issues that are placed before the federal government. I think clearly one area I would like to put out, which has been somewhat interesting to me, is that the federal government can actually go back to being much more thoughtful about future uh, consequences, right? Uh, the whole issue with the stockpile really disturbed me, right? Because of the fact that it suggested that our global supply chain needs to be reevaluated and relooked at uh, going forward. You know, the fact that uh, the federal government has deemed unnecessary offices like the office uh, that dealt with pandemics is disturbing. And I think a lot of that goes back to what Lee has really uh, articulated, which is we're living in the now in our federal government versus living into the future and going back to ways of build building a much more resilient structure. And so if anything can be taken from that question, I don't think we need to change. I think we need to think beyond just the current situation going forward. And we need to see that this is possible. Um, so I, I would really put that out there that, you know, we should never be in a situation where we're a day late and a dollar short simply because we thought that these were unnecessary functions or functions that would not, or activities which would not affect us. Lee, what's your Yeah, thought? so I, I, would, I would do a definite plus one to what Nicole just said about thinking, thinking forward and expanding our imagination. Uh, I mean, I think that's that's crucial. Um, you know, I, I want to pick up on something that Tom was saying before about the, the sort of organizational management of the, the federal government and the sort of bureaucratic hierarchy of, of some agencies. Um, you know, I, I, I think that there, there's a, you know, a sense in which we, we know that there are a lot of things that don't work, but the problem is that we can't think about a consensus on alternatives, that once you open things up, I mean, if you take the 96 Telecom Act, right? I mean, we know yep. it doesn't work, but once yep. you open things up, then, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a tremendous challenge of finding what is, what is an alternative consensus. I mean, even, you know, you talk about the constitution itself and there are, I appear more and more calls for a constitutional convention. You open that up and, you know, what, what, what possible agreement can we possibly have? or the electoral college, you know, so we have a lot of these, these old compromises. And if you open them up in a, in a, tr in a hyper polarized zero sum politics, uh, you're not going to have any space to achieve any level of, of consensus. Okay, uh, good. All right. So I'm going to give you the last question because I think it was a very thoughtful question. It's a big question. So I ask you, we're, we're five minutes away from closing, so, so be <laughs> brief. But if Thomas writes in, the great reforms of the early 20th century, because society was able to break through the, quote, steel chain of ideas, end quote, gave us a series of reinforcing values and policy that effectively blocked meaningful reform. Is there a parallel today and if so, how will we break the contemporary steel chain of ideas? And maybe I would, I would add with Thomas's permission, I hope he doesn't mind, I would add, what, what is the worst steel chain of ideas here that we have to break? Uh, Tom? 
Wow. Well, you know, so I immediately w- went back to, you know, his his comment about the the earliest early twentieth century, and and I, for some reason, Teddy Roosevelt's comment about um, about the barons of the new economy becoming states without a sovereign leapt into my mind. Yeah, int- that's a very interesting. And um, and I think that's probably where we are today. Yeah. And it takes that kind of leadership to step up and say, no, there's going to be somebody to answer to. Great. Nicole? Um, so I had to go off for just a bit because I almost lost power and then I wouldn't have been able to debate Tom. <laughs> So I had to plug my computer in. So Tom, that's the part of the digital economy that does not work. Um, You know, I actually want to agree with Tom. I'm not a historian, but I think, you know, what he's actually suggesting in terms of, you know, looking forward into, you know, what, what, how do we answer these, these challenges, you know, are going to be important. I think history can serve as a lesson to that. Um, And again, based on who comes into uh, our next role as president, you know, go, being able to sit back and just think about these, think on these things in terms of what we do next, I think is going to be really, really important. Good. Lee? Yeah. So I've been thinking a lot about the progressive era and the, the reforms that uh, that happened and, and how they happened. Um, and I, I do think there are tremendous, tremendous similarities between that period and now. Uh, I, I think, you know, one, one of the most important similarities is that that was the last time when there was this level of concentration of wealth and inequality, and also that level of dissatisfaction uh, throughout the country. And you you had an era in which there was tremendous social movement organization uh, uh, from the bottom up. I mean, you think about that's the era in which the women's suffrage movement, which lost battle after battle until finally getting and we are, you know, the hundredth anniversary this year of that uh, final final constitutional amendment. There, senators who had been directly elected became, or who had been appointed by state legislatures, became directly elected. We got the the primary, which I think was a mistake, but it was a major uh, reform. Uh, so, I mean, we fundamentally changed the way we did democracy, and the the reason that happened was because there was a collapse of the old orthodoxy. And there was a, an expansion of the imagination of what was possible and tremendous social movement building. And it happened both from the bottom up, the I think about the populace, as well as from the, the top down. And I think about the mugwumps who were sort of professional class, you know, good government business types who said, the system is corrupt, it's not working. And the populace said, we, we you know, the, the railroads are taking us for a ride, literally. Um, and you know, so, I think there's tremendous similarities. In fact, I, I wrote a New York Times op-ed piece uh, back last year called Trump may have been the, the shock that we needed that detailed some of the parallels between this era and today. And you know, I, I do think that we are seeing there's a, a transformation. There was a transformation in media uh, then. A lot more people were able to, to, to publish uh, in, in the mass circulation media, uh, old old power hierarchies were upended, and I think we're we're seeing a lot of those similar patterns. I mean, it's not quite the same history; it doesn't repeat itself, but I think it does rhyme, and I think we are right. seeing a, a lot of a lot of similarities. So I do think we, and it's not a it's it's importantly it's not a top down thing. I mean, I I do disagree. I mean, I think I see Teddy Roosevelt's role as, as Tom was saying, but I think most importantly is, is that that energy comes from the bottom up. It comes from people who have gone through this crisis and say enough is enough. I, I'm I, I I want change and and a, a younger and we, generation that's and, incredibly dissatisfied and you know it, it is starting to flex are, its political muscle. Okay, we yeah. are out of time. But I am going to end this because there's a question from Monica who says, how do we develop a better system for identifying and nominating people with the requisite skills to lead the U.S.? And uh, my own answer to breaking the chain here is that somehow I think as Americans, we have to get rid of this idea that popularity or celebrity is what we want in our leaders. Maybe we should go back to a more old fashioned idea that we just want competence and experience.
and maybe we wouldn't be having the kind of conversation we're having today. So anyway, I want to thank Lee Drutman, Tom Wheeler, Nicole Turner Lee for joining us today. I want to thank all of you who wrote in some very, very good questions, not all of which I could get to. Um, uh, thank you so much. And I hope you'll join into the Brookings um, forums as they come as they come online. And um, thank you again to the A. Alfred Taubman family. Bye bye now. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.